Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Alan Tansman, director of the Townsend Center of the Humanities. And I'd like to very quickly get out of your way because we have many people here to hear from in what my colleague Marty Jay has called the speed dating forum of intellectual discourse with so many people on the podium. Um, unfortunately, I have to um, tell you that Carol Gluck suddenly couldn't make it. Um, she's in town, but she couldn't make it, and she sends her regrets. Uh, we're here to think about history and time and the presence of the past and the present and the present's hold on the past, very small issues. As a student of literature, I've lived in the shadow of the work of historians like those with us today. And I thank them all from, for coming from very far away, although Marty didn't come from very far away. But thank you for your presence. These are historians who address these questions always implicitly or explicitly. I'd like to very briefly introduce them to you, and I should say that I'll be saying much less about them than there is to know. Hayden White, I think, was born in Tennessee, and later is from, right? <laughs> from Detroit. And Detroit. And is from Detroit, uh, proudly, um, and graduated Wayne State in 1951, as coincidentally or not Harry Harry Tunian did. Not in 1951, I think, but they both, oh, later. later. <laughs> <laughs> and Harry, as you can tell by his accent, is also from Detroit. <laughs> the first book of Professor White's I read, and I use the word professor here because I think I read him when I was in college, was um, Metahistory, the Historical Imagination in 19th Century Europe. It is, it was, it is the rare book that sends crashing down waves upon waves of enriching provocations for students of across many, many disciplines. And I recall a moment then of optimism, and not sure I feel this now, about the possibility of the true interpenetration of disciplines. Professor White spent much, if not most, of his career at Santa Cruz and is the author most recently, I think, of the 2014 The Practical Past. Last week. Last week. Um, as for Harry, I call him Harry because he's been a teacher and a mentor for many years. My first encounter with his writing was the 1989 postmodernism in Japan. I was thereafter powerfully influenced by all of his writing. I would particularly mention his 2000 Overcome by Modernity, History, Culture, and Commodity in Interwar Japan. Harry spent much of his career at Chicago and was also the Dean of Humanities at Santa Cruz and co-editor of Critical Inquiry. Um, I was taught for strange reasons in graduate school to be scared of Harry and his work by my advisor, and with shaking hands, I sent him a manuscript, not knowing him, and he wrote back 10 single spaced pages of critique. That was quite a wonderful experience. Uh, moving backwards in time, for me, that is, I first read Marty Jay's work. Uh, Marty's from the Bronx, by the way, and according to his wiki site, he is Jewish, I just read. Um, I first read his, um, his <laughs> if you hadn't noticed, uh, I first read his work in 19, I first read his work in 1973. If you remember 1973, and some of you don't, I was 13. Um, I think I was a little high, and I, I don't think I understood the dialectical imagination, and I couldn't really have understood it, but it was one of those books that, without understanding it fully, uh, really lights a lifelong fire and intellectual passion, and it did that for me. He's written some books since that time. Uh, the most recent one I've read is his 2010, The Virtues of Mendacity on lying in politics. But I think you have a much more recent one too, right, Marty? Yeah. Um, Ethan Kleinberg, who I think is from Los Angeles, right? Yeah. Um, I came to know without knowing him through the pages of History and Theory, a journal of which he's the executive editor and which I've always read accompanied by the feeling that I wish I had become an historian myself. Although there's much too much responsibility in being an historian, so. Um, he's the author of Generation Existential, Martin Heidegger's Philosophy in France and is completing another work, The Myth of Emmanuel Levinas. Just to mention two more of his most recent pieces, Freud and Levinas, Talmud and Psychoanalysis Before the Letter, and Interdisciplinary Studies at, the, at a Crossroads. And finally, the, um, the cause for this occasion is Elko Runia, this year's Avon Ali Chair at the Townsend Center. Elko's Move by the Past, which is largely the topic of today's discussion, Discontinuity and Historical Mutation, has just been published. Reading it, I felt the kind of excitement I did reading the works by these other authors on the stage. I've given it out to students and colleagues. I've used it in seminars in Japanese literature. One small but very significant measure of the work's freshness and clarity and reach is that many of the final papers in that seminar were conceptualized through his thinking, even papers on classical Japanese poetics. He likely would never have imagined such a thing happening. 
Elko's recent writings include a vulgar metaphysics embodying history, Lenin's intuition of the deed, and inventing the new from the old, from White's tropics, I guess this white, um, to Vico's topics. He'll be at Berkeley for the next month. He's offering a seminar titled Revolution from the Fictitious to the Real, and his Avenelli lecture on November 17th is titled The Theory of the Accomplished Fact. On that occasion, I'll introduce him more formally. For now, you might want to know that he studied history and psychology at Leiden University and worked for some years as a psychologist on a faculty of medicine. His book, Waterloo, Verdun, Auschwitz, will soon be published by Knopf as a liquidation of the past. In that book, he struggles with the question of why the Holocaust remains a past that will not pass away. Elko has had more than an academic career. He has had a private practice as coach for medical doctors. I don't know what that means at all, but. <laughs> um, he has published a novel about the disastrous Dutch mission to Srebrenica in 1995. And in 2002, his research project, Commuting, Committing History, was awarded a five-year grant by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. That project explores the thesis that historical landslides, like the French Revolution and the First World War, are not rooted in what came before them, but are the results of what he calls into cleanness leaping, of jumps into history, remedying cultural vertigo. To conclude then with Elko's own words, I keep believing that with every new book on or article I make a fresh start, only to discover afterwards that what I've written is just one more variation on what clearly is my theme, the scandal of discontinuity. But though apparently I cannot escape from my theme, I can at least break it down into three domains. One, how is discontinuity absorbed and dealt with? Two, how is discontinuity created? And three, how can a theory of history accommodate discontinuity without domesticating it? So the way we'll work, uh, uh, Elka will first speak for about 10 minutes, and then each of the panelists will speak for about 10 minutes, and then there'll be a beautifully flowing conversation. Um, and hopefully around 5.30, we can pause for comments and questions from you all. Um, we don't have an order. We can go from the far side to this side. I was told to have Hayden go last. I'm not sure why. Um, but we can go, Harry. I'm the oldest. Oh, is that why? <laughs> Are you the oldest? Yeah. So with that, please welcome. <laughs> no one's older than me. <laughs> Elko and the panelists. And I invite Elko to the stage. Okay. Thank you. How do you know all these things uh, about me? That's, uh, <laughs> I thought it was quite not, not very well known. For me, it's, it's uh, of course, a very great, great pleasure to be here. It's also a bit difficult to be uh, obliged to speak in English. So it, it, I'm not very used to it, so I will try to do my best. But some, sometimes I have to find, uh, find the right words. I hope you forgive me for that. Um, well, um, in America, I always tend to underestimate things, underestimate distances. Uh, I, uh, up till now, I, I always have been late for the appointments I have here because it's, it's, it's always uh, a longer distance than I uh, imagined. It's, it's also much hotter. Uh, I underestimated the heat. Um, I, I talked to my, my girlfriend back in, in the Netherlands. She's actually skating. <laughs> Just imagine. Um, and I also underestimated the, 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 the audience. This is a huge audience. Uh, so I'm very, very um, happy with uh, the turnout for this, this meeting. Um, it's also a bit unsettling walking through these corridors to see my own face uh, every uh, <laughs> couple of meters. I'm not used to that in the, in the, in the Netherlands, in my own uh, university. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, this, this meeting is supposed to be about my book, uh, Moved by the Past, um, and I want to say a few words about what the title means, what, what, I'm, what my project is in, in this book. Um, and I think the title sums it up very neatly. It's about how we are moved by the past, and I think it can be... Um, you can make a distinction between two things, moved by the past in an emotional way, uh, that every now and then we, we, we come to be overwhelmed by, by the past, like in nostalgia and um, the historical sensation, historical experience, like Frank Enkersmith uh, has it. Um, but also being overwhelmed by the past, by uh, the way we sometimes act out uh, the, the, the past. Um, um, 
for, for me, being overwhelmed by the, the past has to do with uh, the notion of being uh, surprised by ourselves. Every now and then we turn out to be surprised by ourselves. We are surprised by the deeds we, uh, we most evidently do and deeds that are not included in our own identity. That, that's um, one of the main themes of the book, how we come to act in a way uh, that's um, that even surprises ourselves. And, and I think that are the revolutionary moments in history. Um, the people um, every now and then surprise themselves by deeds that they didn't know they were able of, uh, that were at odds with the, their identity. And there are a lot of examples, of course, of it. I think Robespierre and Saint-Just just invented themselves um, making the revolution, the, the French Revolution. Um, you could also say Trotsky and Lenin um, invented themselves in the orgy of improvisation that was the Russian Revolution. Um, Slobodan Milosevic invented himself in his uh, no, uh, notorious speech at Kosovo Polje as, an, as a Serbian nationalist. Um, and you might also say that George W. Bush invented himself uh, at, at the ruins of the World Trade Center. Um, and I think th th that are very interesting revolutionary uh, moments in which people are really overwhelmed by the past. So you could say, just to take the last example, that George W. Bush invented himself as a crusader. Um, and the term of the crusade brings me to one of the things that is um, treated in the beginning chapters of the book, that's the notion of, of, of presence, uh, the notion of presence in the sense um, that I think the, the past of the most interesting part of the past, I should say, is not um, something of the past. It's, it's the past as, an, as, as, an, as Freud would say, an actuelle macht, uh, as a force really operative in the here and now. Um, so the notion of presence, um, draws attention to the, the past as something that is really something of the present, something that um, is an operative, sometimes powerful force in the presence that can sometimes overwhelm you in historical acts. And in that sense, you m might say the past uh, moves us in a way that we cannot, or we couldn't beforehand really imagine. Um, so that's my project in the book to try to get a handle on how we are moved by the past. And I should add that being moved by the past is not just something that um, we just passively undergo, but also it can also be something that we really are looking for. Uh, I think most modern commemorations have the form of a kind of, um, um, a kind of search for how we can be be moved by what, what had happened in the past. So, for example, the recitation of, of names, um, uh, like in the commemoration of the disaster at the World Trade Center, or nowadays in almost every uh, commemoration. So the recitation of names is a strategy to evoke presence, to, to, to have us moved by the past. Um, so presence is not just something that can uh, overwhelm us, but it, it is also a kind of need, a kind of thing we, we are really looking for, being overwhelmed by the past in that sense, having a real emotional connection with, uh, with the, the, the past. Well, that, I think that's by way of an introduction what I would like to say. Thank you. One of the things that, that I found most interesting, I mean, uh, in El Corunia's book, of course, is, 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 is really his first, his opening pages. And any book that, and he starts, it starts with any book that opens with the observation that historians don't think uh, should be greeted with a mix of awe and nervousness. I mean, that's the way I felt. And uh, awe in the sense that it's hard to disagree with the sentiments behind this lapidary uh, 
uh, declaration and nervousness because you're not sure if you're included uh, in, uh, uh, in this general condemnation that heightens the fear <laughs> that you finally have been caught on. So with that, I mean, I, then I discovered there is one thing that, uh, certainly one area or ground that, that, that uh, Rooney and I really do share, but perhaps for different reasons, it'll become a little clearer as I go on, uh, is that uh, we both believe in messiness. What I found most interesting and, and instruct in, uh, instructive in Rooney's essays is his willingness to cultivate views about history and the past that come not only from people who are decidedly not professional, professional historians, but those who, uh, ref right. you know. Oh, okay. Is that better? Okay. But those, but those who, cho who chose to reflect on the history, uh, on history in the broader sense as interventions uh, into the critical instead of the substantive philosophy of history. And, uh, you know, people like Vico, Marx, Burkhardt, and even Freud. The historical locus of none of these pe thinkers is the nation. And I think that's important because I think that, that one of the, uh, both the advantage and therefore the disadvantage I found in, 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 in much of Runia's essays is that he really does ignore the problem, in other words, of, of, of the nation or the national history as a form, basically. That's probably on the plus side, but on the other hand, of course, many of the examples he gives could have, you know, are, you know kind of conformed to many of the conventions of national history, whether it's Dutch or British or Japanese. Here I'd like to return to his, one of his principal observations, which of course, as he presented, it was the idea of presence, as it refers to the existence of the past in the present, and thus the starting point of historical inquiry rather than the past. In this regard, the present really, uh, uh, you know, uh, represents a kind of, of now of everydayness. It became the source of history's authority, it becomes the source of history's authority what others have renamed as the historical present. In fact, the recognition of presentism, as Runia puts it, or presentification, as others have put it, offers a uniquely productive perspective from which to imagine the status of the historical and how it might be released from the limits, the limits of an hermeneutic confinement that insists on causally yoking the present to what preceded it in the interest of fixing the continuity of meaning. Now we know that, 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 that Runeo early declares that he really is not interested in pursuing the idea of meaning. Runeo is right to propose the mutual, as he puts it, entanglement of continuity and discontinuity in this respect, and the necessity to make adjustments, I'm quoting from him, the adjustments many philosophers of history have hesitated to accept, especially the demand to start from the present as an incomplete an ongoing process rather than a finished past. But I have to add that the entanglement of continuity and discontinuity are not static positions where, what time, where, where one successively replaces the other when the music stops. They are also different kinds of temporalizing processes or temporalizing processes in different registers. It might be pointed out that a good deal of national history is far more receptive to me meditating on the completion of the past uh, rather than uh, a present that is supposed to commemorate its achievements. Now, as for models, I think that, you know, he, he points out, I mean, he gives a number of examples, but I think that Freud probably is one of the best and earliest. Freud, according to Runia, seems to be, uh, you know, one of the very first to really recognize the importance uh, of the present, in as much as he exemplified uh, an instance, an early instance, of a thinker or recognized from his own therapeutic uh, experience that the present provided the royal road to understanding the past uh, that remains co-present with, uh, with the past. This was especially the case of the early uh, work of Freud, the, I, I think, of the psychopathology of everyday life, where Freud equated everydayness with the present, the now, where both personal lives and pasts were experienced and housed in concealed death, which the uh, dead depths, which the surface slips symptom, symptomized. Here, Runia, I think, is, is, is correct to propose that the present takes you to the past, not on a backward journey, 
but to places within your sight, digging below to gain access to depths, depths you didn't expect were there. This is a quote. It is where the inquiry starts, or should start, which promises to lead to uncovering those coexisting but often concealed traces of the past, an encounter prompted by recognizing its apparent absence as something that is there but missing, and I'm quoting from here again, trying to ascertain in what respect the present cannot be understood but by turning to history, end of quote. What struck me about this account is the absence of Marx. Even though Runia quotes a famous passage from the 18th Brumaire in a, in a later chapter dedicated to the, to the invention of the new from the old. In this respect, it was Marx before Freud, I believe, who fully grasped the primary importance of the present and the coexistence of the past and the present wherein it remained hidden until animated. This is, I believe, the way Marx presented his histories, the class struggles in France and the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, which prompted Engels to observe how the, narrative, uh, how the narratives unfold as if they are taking place before your eyes. This was, in fact, Marx's te uh, technique. But what the reader is made to see in, this te in the telling is not necessarily all that is happening. For Marx, the past is not, in its immediacy, historical. It becomes historical under the imperatives of the present. The past doesn't stretch out before the present, but it resides below it, sometimes alongside it and behind it, as historical, as he put it, as historical presuppositions that need to be identified. The act of bringing it or bringing them to the surface requires digging into the depths of the present. The new way of writing uh, summoned by Marx is based on recognizing the centrality of temporal forms like contretemps and non-contemporaneity. All this, I need to remind you, or should remind you, appears in the preface to Capital One, which echoes his more distant critique of history in, uh, uh, stated, of course, in the German ideology. The point is that the dead do not bury the dead. This is the quote. You all know it. We suffer not only from, the cap from capital's development, but also from the incompleteness of that development. Alongside the modern evils, we are oppressed by a whole series of inherited evils uh, from the passive survival of archaic and outmoded modes of production with their accompanying train of anachronistic social and political relations. We suffer not only from the living, but from the dead. The dead seize the living. In other words, the past never really disappears, but continues, to st you know, st continues stalking the present. Uh, where these, you know, I mean, Marx and certainly in his histories pointed out, you know, in other words, how the past really operates through these, these specters, for example, these ghosts, Alp, I think was the German term that he used. Uh, and what he was concerned with is, what I think he was concerned with was how these discordant times intera interacted in such a way to make politics actually appear. Here the model with Marx, that Marx is, is actually talking about is uneven uh, an uneven combination of synchronic non-synchronisms or contemporary non-contemporaneities. Continuity with discontinuity, not one or the other. What Marx later explained in his letters to Vera Zasulich, as the, uh, and she was a Russian progressive who had written him, continuity, I mean, uh, uh, as, as the compatibility, as he put it, the compatibility of the archaic with the contemporary present. Marx articulated these heterogeneous temporalities into a nonlinear explanation of historical development, an interaction of levels of, of non-contemporaneity in the historical multiversum. In Rooney's reckoning, metonymical substitution, as he puts it, substituting one context for another marks the moment of discontinuity but also announces the presence of temporality, the collision of different times or, different, or, or levels of temporality, the spectacle of an activated contem contemporaneity of the non-contemporaneous. One more word. This brings me to my last observation, which relates to Runia's effort to show the way the new emerges from the old. 
which relates, of course, to um, which uh, the, the, I'm sorry, uh, how the new uh, emerges from the old as an operation that promises to reconnect critical and substantive philosophies uh, of history. For him, this requires getting in touch with what he calls the bowels, the reality of what he earlier referred to as the presence of history. Rooney's purpose is to find a way out of the search for meaning authorized by hermeneutic domination of historical practice, that is, what he calls representationalism. As I might have suggested earlier, I think that this modality is embodied, of course, in, in, in national narratives. Uh, perhaps uh, it, it's indistinguishable from national narratives, and a preference for horizontal linearity insisting on a movement from a before uh, to an after. Instead, Runia uh, recommends what he calls an unrepresented way. Uh, the past, in other words, inhabits the present, coexisting with it in unrecognizable places in the now. With the appeal to metonymic reduction, or not reduction, uh, 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 metonymic uh, uh, substitution, he's convinced that it is possible to transfer presences uh, instead of submitting to the pursuit of meaning, which is produced by metaphorical changes that generate the impulse for securing historical continuity. In this regard, I think he's correct to propose that historicism with a surplus production of history always, it seems to me, always has been a kind of a ceaseless attempt to overcome the specter of discontinuity that invariably disturbs, disturbs the present's dedication to affirm the order of fixed meaning. This is, uh, you know, a, a let me, let me conclude with this. Uh, uh, what I would like to suggest, of course, is that it was Marx, again, who gave expression to how the old was appropriated by the new, in this, in this case, capitalism, and resituated in a, a different environment to, to, to serve the quest for value. What he described in Grinrisse as capital taking over what it found useful from the past uh, at, or what was at a hand, and putting these older practices to work for a new economic system, different from the one in which they had been developed. In this logic of appropriation, which can be applied to, in, in, to other domains other than the economics, we have a continuing and repetitive instance of how the old is resituated in, in a new present, or new present context that provide occupancy for newly configured combinations of historical temporal forms, past presents, that are continuous in their discontinuity. Marx's approach, I think, shows closely, respond, closely corresponds to Runia's emphasis on, the starting, on starting from the present to locate what is missing as a condition of historically understanding it. In the same way, it complicates or replicates the verticality Runia proposes as the approach to probing the depths of the present for the past. But the last thing that, that, that needs to be said about this is that despite the usefulness, it seems to me, of, 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 of an idea of metonymic substitution, which is really an essentially a formal description, in other words, is what's going on, I think we still need an accounting of how and why these homogenous times of capitalism, for example, are disturbed to determine when uh, uh, we encounter the moment politics attains primacy over history. That is to say, we really do need, in other words, another kind of explanation, in other words, that does exceed, in other words, the formal constraints of, 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 of using these rhetorical uh, figures. Thank you. Uh, I first uh, came across Ilka Runia's work, must have been about a dozen years ago, when I was asked to write an introduction to a catalog for uh, a museum uh, exhibition at Mass MoCA in Western Massachusetts uh, called Historic Occasions, which 
uh, brought together a number of contemporary artists who were dealing with historical themes. Uh, Jeremy Deller, uh, uh, Trevor Paglin, quite a number of interesting uh, figures. Uh, and what I noticed uh, in their work uh, was that uh, none of, of these artists attempted uh, a representational recreation of an historical event, unlike the great history paintings, say, of the 19th century, in which one saw the scenes of battles or uh, coronations or whatever. These were very different. So it was a mode of relating to history that uh, was uh, anti-representational. Uh, a lot of the artists uh, used objects from the past or they had uh, photographs of recreations or whatever they were doing, it was simply not representational. And so Yoko's notion of presence was very helpful in my attempt to figure out what they were doing. Uh, and I won't go through the argument there, but uh, this was the first encounter I had with his argument about the importance of presence as opposed to uh, what uh, we call representationalist uh, recreations of the past. My second encounter was in a way a retrospective when I had written a piece earlier on a trip I took to Theresienstadt, uh, the uh, concentration camp in uh, Northwest uh, Czech Republic, um, in which I recounted an experience of having my expectations, Holocaust, uh, we might call them uh, tourism expectations, uh, suddenly interrupted, uh, walking through the various uh, cells and uh, other remnants of the concentration camp, I suddenly came across um, the manacles of Gavrilo Princip, who is the uh, young uh, assassin who started World War I by killing Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo. So in other words, what I encountered in a way was an interruption of the narrative that I was uh, reenacting, the narrative of the Holocaust, uh, by an object, uh, a real object, and I held those shackles in my hands, the shackles of this assassin. He had stayed there until uh, he rotted away from tuberculosis in 1918. Uh, and suddenly, uh, this uh, 1939 to 45, whatever you want to call the Holocaust uh, temporality, was interrupted by 1914, 1918. A sudden shock, a sudden sense of the real presence, and literally, this was the presence of an object from the past, interrupting my narrative uh, representation uh, of uh, the uh, Holocaust and Theresian's thought suddenly uh, was uh, it, uh, operating on two different registers at the same time. So when I worked uh, on the, um, uh, the uh, work of his colleague, Frank Ankersmith, whose uh, book you may know on sublime historical experience, this allowed me to understand what was meant by sublime historical experience. And I think, uh, although they uh, have uh, different positions on a number of issues, uh, the idea of presence here and the idea of uh, sublime historical experience in the work of Frank Ankersmith are very similar. Both are hostile to uh, what we might call contemporary representationalism. Both are hostile to the um, hermeneutic pressure that we have to make sense of, to make meaningful, uh, to make coherent, to give narrative, um, uh, uh, in, in a way, uh, logic uh, to the past. Uh, both are uh, trying somehow to get us past <laughs> both narratological and epistemological barriers and get us in touch with, and that's the metaphor they use, not to see it, but to get in touch with the past. Uh, and this idea of presence is somehow the eruption of the past uh, in this uh, way that disrupts uh, the present, and it gives us access to something. Now, precisely what it gives us access to uh, is difficult, I think, to understand fully. And let me read one sentence which I think captures uh, the stakes uh, in this uh, desire. It's an anti-hermeneutic statement and one that uh, gives us a sense of what hermeneutics doesn't provide. This is from uh, the book, which by the way, I recommend very strongly to all of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Ilka writes, because hermeneutics is the primary or arguably the sole tool of representationalism. Representationalism is also essentially metaphoric. So we have a lineup of hermeneutics, metaphoricity, and representationalism. By being bound up with metaphor, representationalism is irremediably horizontal. That is to say, it moves from this meaning to that meaning to that meaning, the way metaphor moves. It moves by giving meaning in a kind of displacement. This means this, this means that, and so forth. It may suggest illuminating, surprising, and inspiring ways to see one thing in terms of another. So it's always, in a way, transactional or translational. But and this is where it gets interesting, but pre precisely because of this, it doesn't bring us any closer to the inexorable and ultimately meaningless numinosity of reality. So somehow presence gives us 
access to this inexorable, why it's inexorable is hard for me to understand, but it's meaningless. It's a kind of, uh, maybe you can point to it, it's ostensibly there, it's somehow something that uh, exists, but in its own terms, not in terms of something else. It is in a way an indication, we might say, of the limits of our hermeneutic capacity to master the past by uh, redescribing it in terms that are familiar. And it gets us close to the numinosity of reality. Numinous, why, a kind of religious term. And then reality. Uh, what exactly we mean by that, I want to you know, push him to help us to explain what he means by reality. Uh, the real, is it a Lacanian real, which of course is very hard to get access to and so forth. But somehow, by uh, not being uh, concerned with meaningfulness, by not being concerned with narrative coherence, by not trying to represent the past, we somehow or leap the barriers of both epistemological and narratological uh, constraints uh, that are present-oriented, that move us from the subject position we have back towards the past. Instead, the past speaks to us, grabs us by the throat, touches us, makes us, uh, in a sense, uh, change. Now, I've, I found this, and that's why I found it useful, both in those two anecdotes. It's a helpful idea, but it seems to me limited. Uh, meaning versus presence. There seems to me a third um, method, or at least uh, a third approach to history, which uh, Collingwood, uh, R.G. Collingwood in particular, brought to our attention many, many years ago, when he argued that what historians do is ask questions and look for answers. Ask questions of the past and come up with explanations or come up with something that will uh, satisfy uh, the itch that we have when we don't have uh, the answer before we ask the question. And certainly when we do history, it seems to me, and I always tell my students to, to think of it in these terms, every paper, every book is an answer to a question. And if they know what that master question is, if they know what it is, the itch that they haven't been able to satisfy, then in a way they'll be able to organize the answer and the book will have an argument, it won't simply be a narrative. So it's not merely meaning, but also explanation. It's not merely presence, but also uh, a solution to a problem. And this aspect of history may not be the only aspect, they're both meaning and I think uh, uh, you know, this notion of presence, both are uh, part of the process, but the Q&A moment, we might say in history, is somehow factored out. Now having said that, and having argued that I like the idea of presence, and like sublime historical experience, I also want to ask um, a, a kind of Hayden White question, and say, look, maybe we can't fully escape representation, because it was in fact the case, so Bakhtin tells us in the discussion of chronotopes, that there was a narratological uh, form that existed in uh, the ancient uh, Latin uh, or Roman novel, uh, The Golden Ass or the Satyricon, in which uh, what he calls a kind of adventure narrative occurs in which something that is normally going along, something that is coherent, something that is everyday, something that is uh, expected, something that is part of the, uh, we might call it, narrative meaningfulness of the world is interrupted. Uh, and he says that whenever we see the word suddenly in these novels, there's a kind of dramatic change and things get shaken and things are initiated and uh, what was a continuation becomes a discontinuity. Now, this seems to me, uh, you know, one of the things that Ilko is trying to get us in touch with, but the point is that this is itself a representational trope. It's the way in which these novels are written. It exists uh, as something which is a part of our repertory uh, of making sense of the past. So I'm not sure it's quite as easy as he or Anka Smith uh, tell us to get outside of representationalism, that somehow we are always ready, even when we talk about discontinuity, we talk about vertical separating horizontal, we talk about meaninglessness. Uh, all of that is part of various rhetorical and narrative and other strategies which have been used in aesthetic terms as well as historical terms. So I would argue in a way, maybe this is ironic, for more continuity with these uh, notions than discontinuity, but I want to hear uh, his own sense of how presence will uh, get us beyond that. Thanks. Thanks okay. So, um, uh, First off, I, I, I want to thank Alan for inviting me here, and I, and I should let you all know I'm having a um, Abraham the Other moment, which is this Kafka parable about a, a student who's a very poor student, but uh, hears that, that he did the best uh, on the exam and is called to the front of the class, and he goes there and stands and then realizes that maybe he misheard and wasn't called and shouldn't be at the front of the class. Uh, this even more so since I did my undergraduate uh, work here at Berkeley, and now I'm 
talking about the way the uh, past is with us in the present and feeling increasingly like I should be sitting out there instead of up here. But, but you'll, uh, you'll bear with me. So um, as it turns out in this book, I think Ilko is quite hard on historians, um, which I think is fine since uh, everyone up here, maybe not Marty, but, but everyone else up here is pretty hard on historians uh, most of the time. And, and one of the uh, uh, criticisms that's presented uh, is that historians don't think. Uh, and I think actually a more charitable reading of what, what the, or what I take this to mean isn't that historians don't think, it's that implicit in the way most historians work uh, is the theory that they use, and thus it doesn't need to be made uh, explicit in the ways that theorists of, of history may, may do so. Now, whether this is a good or a bad thing, we can, we can discuss. But I only bring that up because that, that's one side. It, it turns out that the historians who Ilko thinks do think don't get off the hook either. Because it turns out that when historians do think, they tend to think like Hayden does. They think about meaning or representation or narrative, or deconstruction, or language, and they run away with meaning in this way that, at least in the argument of Ilko's book, seems to miss. It seems to work away from, from the aspects of the past that are immediately present with us, the way the past touches us, uh, which is, is different than when we're representing the past. A and this... Uh, leads me to a question, and this is something I've been pondering, and actually we've had some of these discussions before, but it strikes me that, that what happens here is a distinct separation uh, between what historians, those who think and don't think, do in writing about the past, in studying the past, in trying to represent the past, and what philosophers of history, at least following uh, Ilko's model, ph philosophers of history do in actually understanding how the past is present with us in this more immediate fashion. This is to say, on the one hand, you have those of us who traffic with representation, and on the other hand, and these are mediated understandings of the past, and on the other hand, you have the way the past really, and I use the term real, really is there for us in an unmediated way. And so I am very curious whether you see this as sort of an, as irreconcilable differences, whether in fact the historians at this point are going to go off and do whatever they're doing, but to really have a philosophy, if not of history, of the past, one has to go this other way, or whether there is a, a rapprochement. And this leads me to my, my second question, because it, it seems, at least in, in chapter seven, and here I believe you're, you're talking about Schiller, and you're very interested uh, in the question of fiction. And uh, you're, you're using Vico's topics, and, and you tell us, you actually admonish uh, 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 historians uh, for not thinking through this relation between um, realist and fictive uh, uh, representation. You say, we do have, following White, we have uh, actually done a good deal of work thinking about the fictive in the realist representation, but in fact, what historians now need to do, what they now need to start thinking about, is the realistic in fictive representations. And, and we talked about this earlier, about the way you see this happening in Tolstoy, for instance. But counterintuitively, in the last chapters of the book, you turn to an evolutionary model of history. A and here, the evolutionary model is predicated on these notions of science, of biological, evolution, uh, and other models of science, and it moves in a way that doesn't seem to recuperate either the, the critical apparatus that we had uh, by looking for the fictive in the realist, but also stepping away from the way uh, the, the, the realistic might be active in the fictive. Uh, and thus, we're, we're left in a position, and you criticize big history and deep history as somehow uh, a, a place where the mantle of, of history and historical work has been taken by these outsiders, and you caution, in fact, that, that you would like us to, the historians, somehow to come back and, and take it back, to, to not cede that ground, 
And yet, toward the end of the book, it strikes me that in the search of a kind of a continuity, of a big speculative philosophy of history, you are in fact seeding that ground. And I wonder if you could reflect on that tension between the turn to science and the turn to scientific discourse as the ground on which you build this uh, evolutionary theory of history, uh, as opposed to your, your quite strident call actually to learn, to look to imagination and to fiction as, as the site. And, and that leads me to my, my final, uh, Carol wanted them to be provocations, so this is a, a provocation. Uh, because at the end of the book, you, you talk about this question of agency. Um, and there is a sort of worry about agency in both the model of presence and in this evolutionary model. And I, I don't think it's um, a determinism. Uh, I think, I, I suspect a kind of fatalism uh, that we are fated to uh, act in certain ways as the past presses on us. You tell us in the beginning was the deed, and in some ways the deed precedes any kind of notion of cause or change or agency. It's the deed that makes us do it. It's not us that, that does the deed. And that may be the case. And in some of the moments where you're discussing this, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's always charming. Uh, he talks about how, uh, and I've been having these moments all day, like he heard a song by ABBA on the radio, and of course he never liked ABBA, but he realizes the way that ABBA was uh, a part of, of, of this moment, and the ABBA moment comes and affects him in the present in this clear and palpable way, uh, and, and that's kind of a nice and warm moment. But this kind of fatalism takes on a different shade when he talks about what happened in Abu Ghraib and he discusses the way that the American soldiers who are using these facilities were somehow, well, I'll use the term doomed, to repeat the atrocities that had been done there before because the atrocities of the past were so palpably present in the site. And this does trouble me, because I, I worry about ethical, the ethical ramifications of such an argument and whether it removes any sense of, of responsibility agency, cause, I, I, I'm not sure. And then in the evolutionary model, there's an echo of this as well, because uh, if I'm understanding it right, the very interesting and provocative argument is that uh, we've actually evolved to a state where we, humans, have to create our own crises to then provoke further uh, evolution, selection, uh, adaptation, and I don't know if progress is the right word, but movement, forward. And thus, mutations, mutations thank you. Uh, on, on this reading, of course, something like global warming perhaps is not something to be worried about, but another opportunity for us to move ourselves forward. And again, it strikes me there is a kind of fatalism at play. These things which may have had a moral valence on another reading all of a sudden become things that, in a way, happen to us. And we're always reactive. And so I am very curious about the, the, the role and place of the human and, of course, the moral ramifications, if there are, or whether you see this as, as in sort of an amoral scaffold of just how things are. So. <laughs> the tears in the fabric of, the, of history, is that it? Or tears? and the fabric of history. Um, Michael Roth says, a lot of people live with their past without any problem whatsoever. Uh, a lot of people, in fact, the majority of people live with their past uh, or come to terms with it and get on with uh, the work, uh, everyday work of uh, getting to the cocktail hour uh, or whatever your uh, telos is for the day. Um, <laughs> Now, um, I think we should have to draw, I think that in a field like history, which knows, the practitioners of which know what they're doing, they know how to do it, they know what counts as a good job and what does not. In other words, it's a profession. It's been professionalized. In a field like this, you don't get many revolutions. Ever so often on the periphery, someone will come in from literature and say, oh, you know, uh, uh, Silas Marner really tells us more about the 19th century than, 
and therefore literature. You see. Or the psychoanalysts will come in and uh, tell us that we've forgotten the body uh, and we'll get the history of the body then. Uh, the historians are very good at taking up most of the things that I was, uh, or the, we on the left were recommending uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s have been taken up in our fields of a conventional historiography right now. Think of post-colonialism, a great and interesting uh, field of development. Gender studies, and by the way, I noticed that this is an all-male panel uh, in politically correct Berkeley. Uh, this uh, made me remember the 60s uh, when, when that would not have been allowed. There's such a thing now as thing history, the history of things. Uh, there is a, a growing uh, eco uh, ecological approach to history. Jane Bennett, uh, who was a philosopher, uh, represents it at Johns Hopkins. So they're always, people are never quite satisfied with what the historians give them because what the historians give them is adequate reason for things being what they are. I mean, they provide genealogies uh, of the present. Now, I think that uh, what Elko, and no one is going to get, a, this is why Nietzsche quit his job in, in Basel, uh, why Marx could never get an academic uh, appointment, uh, why Burkhardt refused to participate in the professional uh, activities of the historians of his time. Now, I think what Elko is talking about is not history, but the past. And I make a distinction between the two, and too often they're run together. So when people think, oh, I'm interested in the past, oh, you're interested in history. No, the past is everything that is there in that particular place, and, the, and history is that part of it which has already been mapped it's already been mapped in some way. Historians write for other historians nowadays. They don't write for the general public. Uh, and they're doing the kind of uh, refinement uh, of, uh, uh, pre of a form of uh, representationalism of the past that's constantly being changed, uh, modestly always. Um, very few people followed my suggestion of 50 years ago that we could need a, a Dadaist history or a surrealist history, that if you were going to say that historiography or historical writing is an art, maybe it ought to be a modern art uh, <laughs> rather than a, a classical uh, art. So, I, I, but the past is, is, is the problem. You see, uh, the histori the, that part of the past that the historians have mapped out is not a problem for us. They've taken care of it in a way, like Hilary Mantel does. Uh, uh, what I've discovered is that historical knowledge can never help the individual solve a problem in the present. Never. History does not relate to me at all. Only in the fantasy, when I think of myself as Philip IV uh, trying to deal, you know, and I think I'm there in Philip IV's uh, study trying to uh, run the empire, uh, then, you know, delusions of grandeur. Uh, uh, but Whenever it comes to any kind of personal problem that comes back, that's noctreglic, that, that forces itself upon me in, in the way that Freud uh, called noctreglic height, something that I can't let go of and I can't quite uh, digest, I don't go to history. I would never go and read a history book to help me with that. Uh, so th I want to suggest that the individual past, the past of individuals and of most groups is not, has very little in common with the historical past. And that the historical past, no one ever lived it, it only exists in books and articles. No one lived uh, the 19th century that Hobsbawm writes so brilliantly about while they were living it. Uh, I doubt that very few people, well, I'm old enough now that I can, that much of what is regarded by you all as the present, no, as the past, is for me still present. Roland Barthes says, when did the present begin? Date of my birth. Everything that's before I was born is in the past, 
and uh, everything that happened thereafter. My students no longer knew who Hitler is or was. Uh, they no longer, I mean, they no longer care. Uh, it's up to us, perhaps, as historians to enliven them uh, to the significance of figures like history. But that means bringing um, the, uh, the normative narrative of Western, uh, of Western history under some kind of critical scrutiny. I understand you've formed a journal, is it at Chicago, called C Critical History? Journal, journal of Critical History? Good. It's a good, it's a good thought. It's a good thought. You know, life, what a concept. Uh, okay, so uh, I think that what uh, Elko is talking about is really that part of the past, and he starts off by saying that's what he's concerned, that's in individual memory, that may be in group memory, that may be in an institutional memory. It has to do with memory and imagination much more than with, uh, than with, um, our knowledge of the past as the historians have mapped it for us. And it has much more to do with individual psychology than most scholarship is supposed to do. Uh, the examples he gives of presence, Abu Ghraib is one, and it's been pointed out that he seems to think that there, there is a presence of place lieu de memoir that act as agents on the events that occur in that place. So that the American soldiers who occupied Abu Ghraib uh, were bound to torture their prisoners because um, torture was distilled, as it were. Uh, distilled, it was stimmung. Uh, uh, it uh, permeates the uh, walls of that prison. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that at all. Uh, uh, you, can, you might have a, I would like, do I want to go to visit Abu Ghraib? Uh, will I have a moment of presence? Uh, uh, will I try to uh, torture my guide? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I believe that this presence movement uh, is, uh, this kind of thing we get ever so often in Western thought. The last time in, in a big way, it was in, during Romanticism. Uh, uh, I, I believe that it's the intellectual equivalent of twilight, of ghosts and zombies and the undead and revenants that we have all over our culture, especially our TV and movie culture these days. Uh, I believe that special effects in the movies can give you more of a sense of the presence of the past than writing can do. I believe that, uh, that images are much more important now for uh, if you want to summon up the past, and, and so did Freud think that, than uh, words uh, and uh, discourse. Well, um, so therefore, uh, I encourage a book like this uh, but uh, I think it's important to realize that the history of historical thinking, neither philosophers of history nor historians are going to take it very seriously. They, have, they know what they're doing, and they're not into this kind of stuff. You know, they're just not into it. So um, uh, the question would be, uh, if he wants... If he wants to affect something like a paradigm shift in the way we think about the past and its relationship to the present, um, he's going to have to use some form of representationalism. And this brings me to my final point. Uh, Elko and uh, Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht, who is the other presence maven uh, working uh, in this field uh, down at Stanford, uh, they set uh, presence over against meaning. And for Gumbrecht, it's one or the other. You can't have both presence and meaning. And they both invoke the uh, notion of Wordsworth's spots of time, uh, uh, Virginia, uh, Virginia Woolf's moments of being. Uh, and uh, 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 Gumbrecht glosses this as 
moments of focused intensity. And an example of him would have been a bum gardener last night on the mound. <laughs> Uh, these are moments uh, that, on, that the connoisseur only can appreciate. Uh, some people were not even interested in watching the end of the game last night. That's why we knew we could get a reservation to Chez Panisse. <laughs> so, uh, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, I don't mean to, I'm not making fun. But the examples they give of presence are not convincing. They're not convincing. Uh, Gumbrecht gives no theater in Japan. Well, a Mozart aria, catching a pass, the tight end, reaching out and catching a pass. He's written a book on, in praise of athletic beauty as well. And finally, a pretty girl who's standing next to him in the, before the ATM, at the ATM. Um, is, is presence gendered? Uh, what's the sexuality uh, of these moments of presence? Uh, they're offered as something that, in a Heideggerian way, uh, will bring us closer to the past or bring the past closer to us so that we can touch it, so that it will be to hand. Uh, Heidegger is behind it. Uh, <laughs> Heidegger's behind, as he's behind a great deal of uh, very important intellectual work that's going on in the West these days. But I, I, I smell, uh, I smell Nazi aesthetics. No, I'm not calling him a Nazi. I've been called a Nazi, uh, but both by my first wife and by uh, critics. But, uh, but. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of Stefan Georg, I'm thinking of Leni Riefenstahl, and I'm thinking of a whole aesthetics that came to fruition just before and after Weimar, uh, of which, and by the way, there's a very interesting article by a Dutch historian named Rick Peters, who points out the similarities, the analogies at least, between Gentile's fascist philosophy of action and uh, this movement towards presence. Uh, don't, Harry, we don't need uh, to, to be read Marx again, uh, or Freud, I think, uh, in order to deal with this. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, ideology, and uh, it's openly such. Uh, and for those of us who believe that it's all ideology, uh, we have to take it seriously as a possibility because it's presented uh, with talent and style. I blurbed a book for Columbia, so uh, I have high regard for it. That's my, my, uh, my word. So good luck, Elko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a, um, a huge amount of things to uh, address, uh, from Nazi aesthetics to, um, um, well, to, to, to Marx. Um, um, I don't know where I shall begin. Well, let's begin with, um, with the fact that, and that also um, says something perhaps about Hayden's uh, uh, response, um, that my project was an attempt to free myself of Whiteian way of thinking about history. And it seems that I succeeded, um, making uh, Hayden so uh, angry and uh, um, um, uh, ma making him say this, this, this. Um, well, I forgive you. You're free. OK, good. Thank you. This isn't actually angry Hayden right now. So. No, OK, no, okay good, good, good. OK. Well, angry isn't a good word, but in, in fact, that was a, a big, um, um, a big. Uh, uh, it was at, at stake for me. Um, I was very much intrigued by by repre representationalism. In, in initially, I, I liked it enormously, but I also felt very, um, very limited by it. And I, I, perhaps um, that was also the reason that I decided to study psychology apart from history. I was. I was, I've always been very intrigued by 
um, the, the tension between history as it was written and history as it is experienced. Um, and I wanted to have a kind of method or a kind of perspective that brought in experience again. That, that was also the reason that I wrote my dissertation about Tolstoy, because Tolstoy is really a master in playing with these two things, experience and narrative. Um, the, the wonderful thing in War and Peace, of course, is that he makes people, or he, he shows people in action, and then afterwards he shows the same people telling about the experience, experiences they just had. And so he is able to, to, to do very interesting philosophical things also in his, in his narrative with the tension between uh, experience and, um, uh, and narrative. And I very much wanted to, 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 um, to, to bring um, the experiential part in again. Um, so in that respect, um, well, no, just I want to ask. I want to, there's another question um, brought up by, by Hayden, but also by uh, by Eaton, I guess. Um, and it was it's contained in uh, in Hayden's remark that um, the individual past has very little to do with the historical pa past. Um, that that is, I think, also the thing Eaton um, said about. Um, well, it, it has a close connection to the beginning of my book, in which I say historians don't think, um, which, of course, is a very stupid thing when you want to sell a book to historians. But um, um, I, I don't really mean that historians don't use their intellect. What I mean is um, that, I, that historians um, uh, tend to for forget what, for me, is the most um, fundamental question in historical research. And that's a question that is, is the, the central question of Gian Battisto Vico. Um, and I think you could translate that question to modern terms in, in by saying that the, the, the thing that is at stake in, in history is the, the question, who are we that this happened? Um, I think that is the, the basic question we, when we are commemorating things, but also the question that is the foundation of much interesting historical research. That, and, and of course, that question, who are we that this happens, um, draws you in personally. It, 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 um, it forces you to forget the classical subject-object distinction that we are historians, professional historians. We are sitting here and we are just studying the very interesting things out there. But there's a slight but crucial difference between we as historians and the things we are studying. Of course, I think that's what most historical research implies, that the slight but crucial distinction between um, the historian himself, herself, and, and, and the object. And I think the question, who are we that this happened, um, forces you to real think through the event. And that's what I mean by the question historians don't think. Um, I think the real interesting history is, is forcing yourself as a historian to think through the event, to really experience the event that, that, that you are um, uh, writing about. Not in the, in the sense that you are writing about something something else, but that, that it has a close connection to yourself. And of course, that's what the major historians that I was being inspired with, like Johan Heisinger, the Dutch historian, but also Jacob Burkhardt, were actually doing. And the prime example would be uh, uh, Burkhardt's uh, Cicerone, uh, which he wrote when he, he visited Italy, and he, he, he went to all these magnificent paintings, and he and he and it was for him it was a kind of building he tried to he tried to to know himself in the confrontations with the, these paintings but also to 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 uh, to fathom these paintings uh, by confronting them with himself so it was a kind of circular project um, and i think that's the same of that's at stake when i say that the important thing is who are we that this happened? You could also say, 
who, are, who Burkhardt would have, would have said, who am I that this could be painted? Um, um, and, and that is the big project also of, uh, I think, the most underestimated historian ever, uh, Giambattisto Vico, uh, who really uh, had the, the Verum Factum Principle. I don't know whether you know it, but the Verum Factum Principle was that the, the only thing you can really understand is the thing you have made yourself. Uh, and he said he made a distinction between nature and culture. Uh, and he said, we can never really understand nature because that was created by God. And Descartes is completely out of his mind by trying to, 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 trying to understand nature. It can never be done because it was is made by God. But culture, that's what we as humans made ourselves and that's what we can try to understand. We can understand because we made it. I think that still is a very inspiring uh, way to practice history, uh, the, the old principle of, of Vico. Um, and that's what I am also trying to do in my book, to, 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 uh, to deconstruct, I, I hate the, the expression, but let's, let's call it that way, to deconstruct the old subject-object distinction and to, um, to bring in experience again. Um, well, there are a lot of other issues, but... I can remind you, Mar Marty was asking about um, what you meant he wanted to hear more about numinosity and, yeah, yeah. and the real. Yeah. That's also, yeah, that's also, I think, a very basic issue. Thank you for bringing it up, uh, Martin. Uh, the numinosity of reality. Um, um, the numinosity of reality, yeah. Um, well, um, I, I am, I'm always being very much intrigued by the, the state of mind uh, from which the First World War uh, 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 erupted. Um, and when you read authors um, um, in, in that period, many of them gave a sense of that there was a lack of reality, um, that, that, that somehow reality had become irreal and not, it, it couldn't be felt. Um, of course, it's a very problematic uh, notion, but I think you can connect it to what, uh, what uh, uh, Robert Musil said, uh, that the eve of the First World War, was the Zeit, die die Tod nicht kannte. Uh, it was the time that has had lost connection to death. Um, so I think the notion of reality um, inevitably uh, brings up the notion of death um, and um, the possibility of death and the, the possibility of um, of annihilation, um, the possibility that things can turn out to be completely different than you, uh, you think they are. So uh, reality, um, in the sense I use it, is, the, the, is the, also the presence of the possibility of death. And I, I think when you are reading the author's uh, on the eve of, in, in the eve of the First World War, you can see exactly that, a kind of wish to be in a situation in which reality can be felt again, which inevitably includes the possibility of death. And I think that's one of the reasons that they so enthusiastically um, uh, part participated or started to participate in, in the war. So when I'm talking about the numinosity of reality. That's what I think is really at stake. That that uh, the coziness and the the the, 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 the coziness of the way things are, but also the kind of sense that it is a little bit unreal, is ultimately very unsatisfactory. We 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 cannot live um, for long stretches of time in that state of mind. I think, and so that's something we would very much like to, to have, a kind of connection to reality. I think, by the way, that's also the reason that people nowadays are indulging in very dangerous things, bung bungee jumping and all that. It's all a kind of a search for um, having a kind of contact with reality again, and also the possibility or the, the, 
you know, the possibility of, of, uh, of death. Um, but there's, of course, there's much more involved, but let's keep it um, with this. Um, Ethan brought up um, the thought that there was an ethical... Okay, yeah. yeah. That's also... <laughs> it, <laughs> it, all, it, it always <laughs> comes down to the, to the Abu Ghraib uh, prisons when I'm, when I'm talking about... Let's uh, talk about, about global warming instead. Global warming, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, I think that, that are different, mm -hmm. different problems. Um, um, it's true that in, in the later chapters of my book, I, I try to establish a kind of evolutionary view of history um, in the sense that I'm intrigued by how we create discontinuities. Uh, so in the first part of my book, I'm very much zooming in on how we cope with discontinuity, with what, what, what the Germans call Vergangenheitsbewältigung. And in the later part of the book, my attention shifts to how we create discontinuities. Um, um, and creating discontinuities, in my view, as a kind of evolutionary function. Uh, I think by creating discontinuities, we force ourselves to evolve. Um, so in most, um, in most accounts of evolutionary history, um, the discontinuities are, are, are leveled out. It, 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 big history, for example, is a kind of project in, in, in many respects of establishing, establishing a kind of new but, but much more um, uh, all-encompassing kind of continuity. And I think it is kind of um, intriguing and um, interesting to come up with a view of evolutionary history in which uh, you zoom in on discontinuity. So in how we, um, how discontinuity um, functions in, 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 uh, in the evolution of, of humanity. That's the last chapter of the, of the book, Our Own Best Enemy. That's, that's the title of the chapter. How we somehow subconsciously are our own best enemy by creating disruptions, by creating discontinuities like revolutions, uh, etc. But uh, I think also the introduction of the euro is a very good example of a kind of catastrophic disruption that forces Europe to evolve in a way that it couldn't have imagined. Um, and I'm trying to, uh, to come forward with a kind of um, um, a kind of um, mechanism that um, that uh, explains this, of, of uh, shows how discontinuity works in, in an evolutionary uh, process. And in that respect, it, I think it's also interesting to say something about the notion of mutation, because um, I think there's a lot of mi misunderstanding about the notion of mutation when historians try to apply that notion and take it over from biology. Um, and of course, and at first I was also myself a little bit confused about the notion of mutation, and it's still in some places is in the earlier chapters of the book. But I think mutation um, is only secondary. Um, and um, to explain what I mean, I should say something about the phenomenon of, of what biologists call stress-induced mutation. Um, we tend to think, um, most people not really um, first in biology, we tend to think that mutations are at random, that there are random changes in, in the genes or in whatever. Um, but that turns out to be not the case. In, in, in some cases, mutations are very specific. And there are many documented cases in which, um, in which a sudden catastrophic event forces a species or uh, a group of, of uh, animals or whatever, forces people to evolve. And it, it has been proven that, that mutations can be extremely specific, geared to that particular catastrophe. So uh, I think it's much more profitable in history to view 
um, the discontinuities like revolutions, etc., as catastrophes that forces us to mutate. And again, the introduction of the euro might serve as an example. The introduction of the euro was a kind of self-inflicted catastrophe um, that induced Europe to mutate. Um, um, so in that sense, uh, well, I, I, I will not say too much about this because it's also one of the things I would um, elaborate on in my lecture, um, the, the Avenali lecture, which will be called the Red Queen history, but more about that later. Uh, um, yeah, okay, that's about the... If you want to take a breather, I can invite more questions from up here and from yeah. the audience as well. well. The audience should be uh, yeah. invited. We can do that. We are now inviting questions from the audience. <laughs> this is the second row. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for occurring to the panel. I, I have to say I don't read your book, and I look forward to reading it. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that everyone uh, on the panel has talked about bringing the present, the past into the present. Uh, it seems to me that all we've been talking about is the present. We've, we've not been talking about the past. Our present seems to be really preoccupied with the past. It has been for a long time. Uh, but I, I do have a specific question, and that is um, the, the notion about creating discontinuity. Uh, it seems to me that if you think of creating discontinuity, if you think of an agent creating, uh, you are really extending continuity. I mean, there, there is a sense in which all you're doing is projecting on to some discontinuous sense of the present, what you're preoccupied with. Uh, I would think, I'm, I'm thinking of Nietzsche and, and Foucault and, uh, and notions of discontinuity in which they happen. They, they happen and you don't project them, you don't intend them, you don't create them. Uh, so uh, how does that fit into your conception of uh, creating discontinuity? Um, well, one of the, of the I, th I don't think it's, it's the motto of this book, but it's the motto of one of my former, former books. It's, it's, it's Goethe's Im Anfang is die Tat. Uh, in the beginning is the deed. That's to say the, the, re the really important, groundbreaking, discontinuous acts are not premeditated. That's to say, it, it, it's, it's not, of course, there is some thought involved, but they are under-motivated. Um, 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 and the, the, the motives for these groundbreaking deeds only come afterwards. And I think the, 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 the French Revolution is a prime example of it. The, the oath at the tennis court, there was not even a program. Yeah? Um, we, we tend to think people wanted popular sovereignty, and that's why uh, the, uh, the, 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 the third estate took over the tennis court and they swore the oath because they wanted popular sovereignty. But when you look into what really happened, there was no program. They didn't want popular sovereignty, and because of that, took over the, 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 and, and pledged the oath on the tennis court. But, but they, they, they. Um, they just acted, and only afterwards they, 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 they thought, well, ap apparently, popular sovereignty is what we want. Um, in, in psychology, there's a very interesting theory about these kind of things. It's the self-perception theory, um, that people not so much uh, know themselves by mean of introspection, but, but they... they they see what they are doing, and, and uh, they, from, from what they see, they, they uh, conclude, well, apparently, I'm this kind of guy or woman. And I think that can also be um, true in history, for example, in the French Revolution, and I think it's true in most um, discontinuous events, that first there was the act, and then there was a kind of motivation, and there was a kind of change of identity that, that made the deed um, 
comparable to what what just had happened. Um, but of, that, that doesn't um, mean that agency isn't a problem. Of course, it's a very big problem in my in my way of uh, uh, theorizing, because how, how what what makes people do uh, revolutionary things? Uh, so. so um, I'm very much intrigued by, 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 by Hegel's The Cunning of Reason, and, and in a sense what I'm proposing is a modern evolutionary variant of Hegel's Cunning of Reason. Uh, that, that doesn't solve the problem of agency either, but it's kind of direction in which I tend to think. So, but th this is where I don't, I, I can't see how you get out of the, the, the hermeneutic problem. You're very hard on, um, on hermeneutics, uh, but, but in a way, uh, you know, you, so you look to Vico, but, but one could also look to Claudenius, right? And in Claudenius, uh, which is a contemporary, uh, the issue is the historical position from which you uh, investigate the past. And that's going to, to do all sorts of things what, to what you're doing to the past. The, the only reason you can get to a real for, for Claudenius, and I would argue this might be, this is true for Vico too, is, is their pre-Kantian pre-critical thinkers. There's a way in which the issue of in the beginning was the deed, which is trying to take issue with in the beginning was the word, is, is a later movement. In fact, I, I would say for Vico and for Claudenius, the word and the deed hold. They hold together. In Claudenius's case, it's explicit. It's a, it's a theological concept that the past is there and, and held by God. And so if you have the right hermeneutic methodology, you can get ba back to the past. Once you go through Droysen and Diltai, the theological hold disappears and all you have is the standpoint. And, and I would say with Hegel too, all you have is the standpoint. Consciousness as it moves along and looks back, of course, is going to look back differently from its position. And even in your evolutionary model, that seems to be budgeted in too. No matter where you are looking back to the past, that hermeneutic, if you want to, or uh, a position of the historical subject has to be accounted for in a way that, that I think puts you right back into that question, that hermeneutic question of meaning that you're trying to, to jump over. And the only way I see you doing it is not, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't agree it's, it's a Nazi aesthetic. I would say it's more like a Kierkegaardian leap of faith. Yeah. 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 Um, well, um, you bring in Gladenius, uh, 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 and of course the, the, the notion of, of, of uh, stay a punct, as he called it, um, is a kind of hermeneutic, um, of includes a kind of hermen hermeneutic uh, uh, project uh, to um, that, that that somehow um, uh, includes the notion that that there is no um, single way to approach uh, the 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 truth of the Bible, but 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 by means of the, state, the, 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 the different uh, points of view, um, it, it can, after all, be established. Um, so uh, the, I think um, uh, Gladenius is a, kind of, uh, is a kind of Leibniz in that respect. It, it, it all comes, uh, the, the, the different uh, uh, kegelsnede, how do you call it in English, uh, the, 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 the cutting points of the, of the cone, uh, they can be they can be very difficult, but the cone itself uh, re remains the same. And you can, after, after all, you can, you, you can try to know the, the, the form of the cone, or in the Claudenius sense, the, 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 the Bible. Or historical events. Yeah. Are you guys talking about Claudenius? Mm -hmm. How many people here have ever heard of Claudenius? <laughs> I mean, you said Cladanius. <laughs> said Cladanius. You said Cladanius over against Vico. What's the force of the argument if no one knows who Cladanius is? Well, the, the, the point is that there, there, it requires a theological position. When you're talking about geometric forms, one can understand in theory what a geometric form is. When you talk about a historical event that happened, it, it, it isn't the same thing. It only holds if something holds it. It's a theological hold in both the case of Vico and Claudenius. That, that's the point. Without it, all you have is the position you are in the present, looking back into it, and that's going to condition you. You can't get back there. There is can no I, getting back. Can I answer? I mean, I think the, the, uh, the difference between Vico and Claudenius is that Claudenius gives us a sense of the importance of 
the perspective from which you look, which is not transcendental, not God's eye view. So you get the first uh, acknowledgement in his work of the historian being situated, particular subject position, whatever you want to call it, and therefore being to some extent constrained. But the crucial thing is that contact with the past can change that perspective. I mean, in other words, you don't simply repeat, you don't simply impose, you don't simply, uh, you know, say what you already knew. I mean, the old Oscar Wilde line uh, about uh, Wordsworth that he goes, you know, to the Lake Country and finds under the stones the sermons he's placed there is, <laughs> is precisely what, what this contact with the past tries to avoid, you know, tries to give us some sort of sense of no, maybe there'll be something under those stones that are different. But I want to come back to the, the issue of, uh, of Vico and the uh, verum factum principle, the idea that you know what you've made. There are lots of problems with that. First of all, who is the we? Who is the we? Humankind, uh, the elite that, no, I mean, who is the we? Who has made the past that is the we? Obviously, only some people have the privilege or the burden of making the past. And we in the present have a different relationship to those people in the past. So if I'm looking at the history of the United States and the history of you know, my people and my history, that's one thing. If I'm looking, say, at the history of a medieval Chinese peasant, I'm doing something very different. I'm, it's an imaginative reconstruction. It's not my history. I'm not evoking my own past. So th there's a very important difference uh, there. And then also, obviously, the we, uh, as we know, any transcendental position hides the peculiarity, and this is a uh, particularity, this is Cardenius's still useful argument, of my own perspective being partial. So there's a lot of difficulty in, I think, evoking the idea of we. And then the other problem is, of course, the verb, to make history. What does it mean to make? Uh, I mean, there's the image, for example, of a shoemaker who makes a pair of shoes, an artist who makes a work of art. It's intentional, it's uh, based on a form, it's deliberate, you know, when it's finished, it's an object. But there's also the possibility of making a mess. You know, I made something, but it was a mess. So I didn't intend that it, uh, somehow. And then, of course, the issue of unintended consequences, the ironic ways in which history operates. So the making metaphor, you know, helps us a little bit, agency, decision, action, all of that is true to an extent. But there's always the unintended consequences. So immediately I make a deed, and the deed gets out of my you know, control and has unintended consequences. So history, whatever we mean by that, is a mixture of intervention and unexpected consequences. And unless we have that dialectic in mind, we end up you know, fantasizing about great men who make history. Well, that's absolutely true. And I think uh, all, all, all discontinuities uh, turn out to be completely different from what was intended. Um, and, and that exactly uh, forces us, in my view, to pose that question, who are we that this happened? Um, and I, I am inclined to even take the radical position that when we study something from a completely, as historians, from, uh, from a completely different culture, we still should use that basic question, who are we that this could happen? Um, and of course, I'm, when I'm asking this, this question, I'm always intending of, of uh, focusing on traumatic events. Um, traumatic events um, that started out as sublime historical actions. Sublime historical actions in the sense, let's do something completely new and let's transcend our frame of, re of reference. That's the, the term of my original project, committing history. Let's commit history in, the, in, in, in all senses of the word, committing as a kind of crime, but also as a kind of commitment. But, but let's deliver us ourselves to the things we turn out to be doing. Um, and, um, with respect to the making, um, of course, that's also a very important concept, making history. What do we mean when we talk about making history? I think the major distinction is uh, between um, 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 allopoiesis and autopoiesis. Um, uh, autopoiesis, as, as the Germans would say, selbstherforbringung, making something out of itself, not constructing something out of itself, transcending yourself in something that is different from what you uh, originally uh, were, the kind of metamorphosis, as, as Burkhardt would call it. Um, and in that sense, I think we 
can say we make history. We, 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 we recreate ourselves by means of the things we turn out to be doing. That's what I mean by making history. But isn't that actually limited? In other words, that's really one of the problems that I've been having. You just stated, I mean, you, you and, and uh, the, that you know you can do this with 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 societies and histories outside of of your uh, you know say Europe or the United States, whether you're European or an American. And I really seriously doubt you that you can. I think that in fact this becomes really one of the real problems of of the kind of maybe the defect of the kind of hermeneutic, in other words, operation, you know, in other words, that exists largely within national history. I mean, it's, you know, you identify with that, in other words, that you, of which you are a part of. I mean, that's, that becomes a kind of untranslatable or, un, you know, untranscendable, you know, horizon. And, you know, when you were talking, for example, in that really wonderful essay where you talk about the Dutch group, in other words, you know, that, that was supposed to save these Serbians, in other words, in 1995, you know, at Srebrenica, and then, of course, the commission, a commission of historians and archivists, in other words, who were uh, assigned the task of studying why they didn't, why 8,000 people, in other words, were murdered, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, the whole argument is that, you know, they began to, they essentially acted very much like the the, the troops, the force that had been sent there. And they, they couldn't come up with a judgment after thousands of pages of, in other words, of, of testimony and so forth. But I, I thought to myself, what would happen, for example, if the group of historians that was selected to study that by the Dutch government came from another country? Would they not have been able to make a judgment? You see, I mean, it was almost predictable. I mean, I would have thought immediately that it was perfectly predictable that these historians, after all that labor, in other words, really couldn't, you know, in, in the end, could not and would not make a judgment, in other words, about whether or not the, the force was responsible, politicians were, in, in, you know, involved and so forth in this, in this particular event. I mean, you know, that, you know, as the director, I think you, you quote, as the director of the project says, others can make the, or will have to make that judgment. I don't know if whether or not they did, I mean, in, within Holland, but it seems to me that that was a perfectly consistent act, and I mean, that's part of that, that, that commission, it seems to me. It was Dutch. It acted, in other words, in, in a predictable way. But if you brought in another group, say, uh, I don't know, French or Turks or, you know, you know, or Chinese, how do you think they would have acted? How can you, and then how would you know, you know, I mean, the point is, is that, is that, I mean, do you think, I mean, in the first place, you can't rely upon their, uh, their capacity, in other words, to know how Dutch think and behave, mm -hmm. which is exactly what the historians on the one hand, as well as the troops on the other, yeah. uh, conducted themselves. Yeah, I, I would have expected from the, histo the, the historians studying the Srebrenica disaster that they, that they were so professional that they transcended their nationality and, and could come forward with a real good um, study a, 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 and a, a real good a report. Study? A, a critical study? A critical study. And what, 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 what they... made a judgment? And what, why why uh, would you have accepted? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean uh, 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 in a sense, it's not... And, you know, there are two things working against that. One is that they were Dutch, and the other thing is that they were professional historians. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a pretty heavy burden. Yeah, it, it, it was. It turned out to be an, uh, an unbearable burden. Uh, but um, <laughs> no, um, I mean, I think the, it, yeah, look, the, the, look, the it happens everywhere. Is, I mean, that kind of whitewashing happens in every one of these, and you know, in these kind of tragedies or catastrophes. Look at that. You know, you mentioned Abu Ghraib. You know, do you think anybody really paid for that, uh, other than a, you know, in the United States, uh, other than a few low-level, in other words, you know, yeah. non-coms? Yeah. You know, well, the, I, the, I think what, what is at stake is not so much the, the whitewashing of what happened, but the thing I tried to elucidate was the extent, the amazing extent, that the historians actu uh, actually acted out the event they were supposed to study. Um, Look, it wasn't a historical study. inquiry. It, it, it was an inquiry uh, to, di directly of the of the people who were involved in the events. It was a legal inquiry. It wasn't a historical inquiry. Uh, uh, if people are still alive involved in the events, you interview them. You don't have to do historical research. You may have to do some, 
but uh, you, your example is bad because our problem is not dealing with something that happened yesterday or two days ago, uh, but uh, something that happened like the Holocaust. Uh, we're faced with the people with thousands of versions of it now, thousands of versions. Uh, a Zionist version, an Israeli version, a pro-Israeli version, uh, God knows how many other. Over, over 50,000 monographs have been written on this topic. Are we getting any closer to uh, bring it again, making it present to us? This is what the whole debate about Holocaust monuments is. Is it not, namely, whether it can create something like an experience? or whether you're trying to document what happened, or are you trying to create, hmm. and you know, you talked about creating crises. This is what Wall Street does all the time, and profits from them. Uh, you know, uh, don't you realize that we're living today in a world that's completely dominated by the corporate uh, structure, and that uh, Mr. Obama, and the whole political is one of the reasons there's no, no, nothing can be done in Washington is that politics doesn't matter anymore. Politics doesn't matter anymore. It's controlled by corporate finance uh, and uh, transnational uh, corporations. Uh, they ca and they create crises and they profit from them. They create them. Now about crises and discontinuities, you're, you may mutate, but you also <laughs> may go extinct. Yeah. Right? Isn't that the, aren't those the options? No, no, no. I don't think so. Um, but but I, the, 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 the the example of the of the Dutch historians is a is a I think it's a perfect example of presence, um, in the sense that the historians re really were taken over by their subject. Um, if you remember, I would I, I called presence uh, uh, instances of uh, the past as an actuelle macht. Well, that was exactly what happened with the, the, the Dutch historians. They thought that uh, the past was something out there, and they um, were the victim of a past that was still operative in the here and now, to such an extent that it took them over and made them reenact. It took them the, over. It took them over. The past it, didn't take over anyone. The Dutch soldiers of, the, of that battalion took over and dominated the uh, exchange, the, the inquiry. Happens all the time in courts of law. The, 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 the past, in the, past in, in the sense that the, the objects they were, they were studying. I'm sorry, there was someone yeah. in the back yeah. wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that we've heard from all of you and you're all uh, brilliant in your own ways, but uh, really there might be some ideas out here in the audience. Um, frankly, I, uh, Hayden White appealed to me more than anybody else in um, evoking another moment like this about 15 years ago when memory came crashing in to sort of eliminate history uh, or sideline history. And this seems to me another example of where, the, in this case, the presence, or he's using the term past very loosely, um, is a way of sidelining history. Now, this may be a damn good thing, because as a historian, now a retired historian, I realize how little the professional work of history has purchase on the vast population of the world, much less the United States. So perhaps we should reinvent history departments as departments of the past and let the kinds of activities that you're describing here, um, the ghostly presences, and the eruption of the, in the past, past the zombie-like um, appearances that we get in popular culture. Maybe that's what our, our students really want to be a part of. They don't seem to be, want to be a part of that kind of craft, profession, hard-digging historians and historical process uh, that we have pretended uh, as a department for so long. So I'd like to hear all of you comment on why the hell are we meeting today? I, is, are we at a crisis juncture or are we just spinning our wheels once again? 
There are no crises in academia. <laughs> <laughs> a department of the past, yes, I agree, where you would have anthropologists, you would have psychoanalysts, uh, you would have any... Uh, Mark, that's what they're trying to do already, reduce what they can Good. Okay. Gabriel Spiegel, the former president of the American Historical Association, wrote to me recently, and she said, we can't leave the past in the hands of just anyone. I said, why not? <laughs> Who owns the past? It's ours, after all. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't, uh, it would seem to me that there are all kinds of different disciplines that are concerned with the past in a non-historical way, in a non-historiological way. Uh, psychoanalysis would be a good example. Freud isn't trying to uh, reconstruct the history of his patients, uh, and it's not a matter of discovering the truth about them. He's trying to get them to live in the present and uh, overcome the dysfunctions that come from uh, the return of the repressed. Uh, that's a very important model, it seems to me, for thinking about our relationship to the past, but not our relationship to history. I, Ethan? Thought, I, I feel somewhat obliged to speak momentarily on historians do that's been represented mostly here is virtually unrecognizable. That is to say, it's largely a very recent past, a past that is uh, in narrative form, directly or genealogically productive of the we or the now, whereas I think that most of what historians do is not about presence but about absence. It's about the alienation or the denaturalization of the present. Uh, it's about showing uh, the hubris of the modern rather than uh, to s produce a subject position of the modern we that's capable of solving particular worldly problems. So I'm wondering what the task, wh whether the task that you've set for yourself isn't so different than the task that the discipline of history sets for itself, that you might not reframe the conversation, not around the unthinking historians, but around the uh, unhistorical philosophers, for instance, or the unhistorical psychologists who lack that notion of the past in their view of presence. Well, that's, that's, a, a <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way of, of uh, framing it. Um, um, what, what, what my, my project is to, to um, um, not to, um, in, in that sense, I'm very, very surprised that um, I get this kind of comment, um, because that's exactly what I don't want to do. Um, I, I think um, um, I, I'm, I'm a very, I think I'm a very passionate historian that um, would not, um, uh, that's to say, I, I, I will not, um, um, I would be very unhappy uh, when uh, what I was doing was so far from the normal practice of historians that they wouldn't recognize it uh, as, as being relevant for what they are actually doing. Um, and um, I think what I'm really doing in my book is addressing uh, real issues for real historians. So in that respect, too, it was a stupid thing to start my book with. Uh, um, but in, in my, from my perspective, the, the, uh, the way philosophy of history used to be, in the sense of being largely involved with linguistic matters, uh, with issues of representation of uh, what uh, of narrative structures, etc., um, left out the real interesting thing about history, which is the, the, the past. And I, I wanted to do something with, as a philosopher of history, with the, the past again, and not just with linguistic structures. So my ambition was exactly that: to 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 as a philosophy of history. Um, to address 
uh, the, the past again. O, 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 that's to say, on, o, of course, on a different level than, than, than most historians would do it. Um, uh, on a more abstract level and on, uh, well, uh, and on a more speculative level, but um, my ambition was to get into contact with the, the past again and not just with super, super structures and ling language, uh, etc. Et so in that respect, it's a confronting thing you are saying to me. Yeah. So on, on that note of, I think, reconciliation with the chair of the history department, <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming and thank you all for participating and doing this. Thank you. Thank you.